take some time to go over this lesson in in English. This is something we did a week before this in Hebrew, and uh, there was a couple of points I wanted to get out and because we don't have it um, televised in, in English, so I wanted to have this out for us. So anyway, we're talking about revival in the end times. Yes or no? And uh, how will that happen and why? So uh, let's look at that for a moment. Father, we thank you for your grace and blessing on this. In Yeshua's name, amen. Well, we have for years, I think for me, between 30 and 40 years, taught that there will be revival in the end times. Teach that primarily from, from um, Acts chapter 2. And let's just go over that in Acts chapter 2. He's quoting from uh, Joel chapter 3 in the Hebrew. And um, he says this, And it says, And in the end times, this is the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And on your, my servants and my maidservants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. Um, we'll stop there for a moment. And uh, just from looking at this, uh, obviously I'm not going to go the whole background of this teaching, but it's clear that the timing of this wasn't 2,000 years ago. It's right before the second coming of Yeshua. The dimensions of it are not just... Uh, 3,120 people in Jerusalem. It's talking about a worldwide outpouring. It's talking about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, of signs and wonders that have to do with the tribulation period. So it seems clear from the context that it's speaking about a worldwide revival in the end times during the tribulation period leading up to the second coming of Yeshua. Uh, I remember when I saw this uh, between 30 and 40 years ago, I was surprised to hear people speaking about this as if this is what ha just happened 2,000 years ago and that was it. But I said, wait a minute, but that, that according to the context that Peter is not saying that was over, he's saying we are experiencing what Joel is talking about that's starting with us now but will get bigger and will be a full worldwide outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the end times, what I used to call Second Pentecost. So... Um, and, and I believe that till today, that it's speaking of worldwide outpouring in the end times. And it also says that many people will be saved, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. Well, that's what we believe. I was surprised to find out recently that there are people that don't believe that. Uh, and can even be somewhat uh, angered about the fact that somebody could believe that there would be revival in the end times. And so I've been trying to understand why that is and, and, and uh, adjust the framework in which I teach this to make sure that we're balanced and, and, and looking at it. So um, the, the point is this, that um, let's go on to the next, uh, I'm two down, but there's already a number three if anyone's on the uh, McCran for me, is on the overhead for me. I'd appreciate that, bring it down. It says, but um, the, pro the question here is the qu problem. The, the, what people say is that, but in the end times, there is going to be tribulation. There's going to be the Antichrist. There's going to be all these problems. How can you say that there will be a revival? You're contradicting what the scriptures are saying. And um, so what do, what do we know? What do we believe? But first of all, uh, that we're not saying that the end times is only revival. So what I'm saying, oh, this is going to be peachy, you know, gone in and it's just going to be, everything's going to be wonderful. No, we're saying that during the time of the harsh tribulation and persecution of the end times, there will also be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and miracles and evangelism. So that may sound like a contradiction to some people, but not to us. We believe that's um, uh, a biblical pattern. However... For those people who believe that they're going to be raptured before the tribulation at all, then they can't believe that there will be revival, obviously, because nobody will be there to help the revival to go. Nobody will there be to evangelize. Nobody will there be to disciple. So I realize that part of the, the anger at the concept that there could be revival is for people that don't just believe that they're not going to be there at all. 
So how could you say there's going to be revival? I won't be there. So, um, but what we're saying is that the, the, there will be difficult times, including the Antichrist, much persecution, horrible difficulties, and yet the, the church will be here going through that, and we'll go through the reasons for that in a moment, and, and that w together with the difficulty will also be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's another example that we just had, the Feast of Esther, Feast of Purim, and we see that in, that's what happened. You have a, 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 a clear antichrist figure in Haman. If there's anyone in the Bible, Haman is one of the four or five clearest antichrist figures in the Bible. In fact, we get the name in Hebrew, Antichrist, Tzorer HaMashiach. We get that from, from the story, from Migilat Esther, Tzorer HaYehudim. So it means he's the one who brings tribulation. It's interesting also that in Hebrew, the word for Antichrist is also has to do with tribulation. Hallelujah. Anyway, but during that time, with this a worldwide persecution of not only the Jews, but anybody that believed in the Jewish God, in other words, all of the believers at that time, God used that period also to bring revival. And many people came to faith during that time. And there was a, so you have this struggle between good and bad. We've also noticed that in our generation, we have seen, at least number-wise, quantitatively, the largest wave of evangelism in history, which happened in the church in China. This happened during horrible tribulation, horrible persecution. So the, the logic that you can't have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and evangelism during the time of persecution is just, it's not true according to any biblical example in the Old Testament or the New Testament, and it's not true in, uh, in the history of the faith. In fact, you could make a pretty good argument for the other side, that you can't have revival if there isn't persecution, but that's not today's lesson. We've also seen that in the Muslim world. There has been... Uh, uh, more Muslims have come to faith in these past uh, eight or nine years since, uh, since what they've called the Arab Spring, since the outbreak of, 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 uh, of aggressive jihadism in the world. And many of the Arab leaders that I know that, 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 that share the gospel with Muslims have said that there's no doubt that the, uh, the greatest uh, Muslim evangelist was Daesh. ISIS, you know, because they, they, they force people to flee from Islam. They can, in other words, they're being so evil, convince people to leave and search for something else. So again, the idea that you can't have revival at the same time of persecution, that's not biblical thinking. That's not biblically uh, logical, and perhaps every time. I also wanted to mention that um, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 7, it's during the time of, of, of tribulation, it also says there's a great multitude that no one can count of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. So that, that also shows there has to be a large group of people that are coming to faith during that time. And uh, even perhaps uh, mo one of the most difficult examples is in Revelation chapter 13. That's the chapter that speaks of the Antichrist, uh, uh, most clearly, at least in the New Testament. And there, But in chapter 14, which is right after it, 14 follows 13, it says that there's two harvests, a harvest of evil in which God will punish, but a harvest of good. He says the world comes to a point of, of um, shelut, um, 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 ripeness for this end times harvest to come. And that's right after the passage of the Antichrist. So you have the, the coming of an evil empire, and then the human race begins to get pushed either toward righteousness or toward evil, and the whole world becomes ripe. And then there's a harvest of evil to those who really become evil to be punished, and there's a harvest of righteousness. And that goes along with Yeshua's teaching in Matthew 13. He said the harvest comes at the end. He gives several parables about this, and he says the great harvest comes at the end. So I've just given you about eight or nine different scriptural references to show uh, how, that could, uh, how that could happen. All right, let's go on to the next uh, one. No, th this is what I want to come. I'll finish on this one. Let's go on to the next one. Um, one of the passages that I find most uh, actually difficult to read in the Bible, but also very pertinent to this question, is Daniel chapter 11. One more uh, shkufit now. Um, in, in, in Daniel chapter 11, uh, it's talking about a historical event that uh, happened uh, before the time of Yeshua, but 
There is a biblical pattern there that seems to can be relevant, at least to turning to biblical principles, also to events in, in the end time. And it, it's, a, it's a difficult passage to follow. The king of the north and the west and the south, and there's these wars and details. And you're gonna, but one of the things that's, that I want just to notice in verse 33 and 35, Daniel 11, 33 and 35, uh, you've got to really sift through these, these verses. It's hard for me anyway. And it says this in verse 33. Umaskile am yavinu la rabin venichelu becherev ubelehava bishvi uviza. And it says, and those who, who are made wise, the, 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 those, those who have a revelation, those in our sense it would be believers, yavinu la rabin, they will make other people understand. In other words, that's in our terminology where they would share the gospel, la rabin. Notice this word rabin here. They will make many. They will bring many to faith. This is during the worst time of persecution. And it says, and they will, and they will, nikshal, they will fall. They will fail. As far as I can tell, you're talking about believers failing from the attacks and falling and, and by the sword and by the fire and by captivity and by, by having their goods stolen. And yet at the same time that the, that the believers are being sort of torn to shreds, they're also bringing many people to faith. Is that possible? Sure it is. Uh, is it God's preference? No, it only happens for a short period of time because it's it's at the right before the Messiah comes, and there'll be no there's no other way to <laughs> God's got to push the envelope to the end to make to, there's no other chance. He's saying for all of my sons and daughters here, this is the last chance to get to people. Even 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 if they kill you, share that this is it. We've come to the end of the time. Of course, I'm I'm drawing that as a scriptural parallel, seeing that in the end times. Although this is a historical event, depending how you interpret this passage. And then it also says in verse 35, Omin and from those group, that group of believers who have, who have the revelation of God, Ikashlu, they will fail. Here twice it says they will fail, the believers. They're collapsing from the, from the persecution. But it will refine them during its happening. Wow. That's a, it's a beautiful verse, but a tough verse. In, this, in the midst of the deepest difficulty, God will be finding him. Uh, and he says, and he will, to make clear and to uh, make white until the end of the times. Now, in verse, um, in chapter 12, we said something similar. He, Daniel repeats it, although this time, it's either he's repeating it or he's saying what happened in 11 historically is going to happen in the future in chapter 12. I don't think anybody would doubt that chapter 12 is a future. So he, interestingly, he says almost the same words going over the same thing. Now in chapter 12, verse 3 and 7. Are you with me? Am I going too fast there? I'm trying to show this dynamic here of the, 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 what's going to happen in the end times in the midst of persecution. God still, there's persecution, there's the spreading of the gospel, there's the collapse of the saints, and yet the purification, wow, it's all, it's all right there. The maskilim yazhiru kazor akiu umatstike arabim kechokhavim leolam va'ed. Hallelujah. It says those who have been made wise, the believers who have the Holy Spirit, they will shine with glory, hallelujah, like the glory of the firmament. And those who make righteous many, again, here it says, this is share, make, making righteous, that's sharing the gospel, bringing people to faith. Rabim, again, you have that word, rabim, many. So both in chapter 11 and chapter 12, you have the word rabim, that many will come. That's a, a very telling. And it says, and they will be like the stars, Forever and ever. Of course, the Apostle Paul picks up this discussion in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says that we will actually get bodies that will shine with glory like the stars in heaven. Hallelujah. Anyway, then he says also in verse, uh, verse 7, just to let me, the moed moadim vachetzi, that's three and a half years, which also seems to be speaking of the end times period. Uchachalot napetz yad am kodesh. And it says that the Yad here, the hand, but meaning the strength, the strength of the holy people will be totally broken and destroyed. Now we understand this. This is just the really the closing moments before Yeshua comes back, where he's saying, "Look, 
just for the sake that a few more people get, could get saved or many people more get saved, I'm going to allow you to go through even, even if you collapse during this time, but we've got this, there's no other chance. We're going to have to pay every price just to get to them. Interesting, by the way, when you think about them shining in glory here, so it's not just being refined, it's being glorified. In other words, sanctification process leads to glorification. Sanctification to, we believe in both the sanctification of the saints and the glorification of the saints. So here he says, they will be crushed, refined, and then begin to shine like the stars of heaven. Wow! <laughs> Hallelujah. It's very exciting. All right. Um, let's, let's just pick up uh, two other explanations about uh, how revival can happen in the end times. Let's go down to... Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, uh, next one, which is um, one of the clearest passages. It so clearly shows that the good and the bad can happen at the same time. We, you know, we sing this song so much, we may have missed the words on it. You know, you have to, maybe we should stop singing it for a moment and think about it. Kumi ori, we have, we have about 10 songs with these words in it, it's so beautiful. But anyway, it says, Kumi ori kiva orech uchvod Adonai alech zarach, Isaiah 60 verse 1. It says, uh, arise and shine, uh, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is shining upon you. It's for darkness will cover the earth and deep fog the peoples. But on you, the glory of the Lord will, sh the gl the Lord will shine upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. goyim. So he says, and, and that nations, peoples will come, particularly Gentile nations, if you take the word goyim here, uh, Gentile nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. Well, here we have just a, a beautiful prophecy that's saying it's in a time when there will be total darkness over the whole world. The worst time, evil empire. Empire of the Antichrist. But you, in the middle of it, you will be shining with light. You'll be shining with glory. You're going to be glorified right in the midst of this happening. And it's going to be so strong that you're actually going to draw multitudes of nations to faith right in the midst of the darkness. So, that, so the, again, the idea that you're going to have a, an evil empire and the saints shining glory at the same time is not a contradiction. It's a conflict, but not a contradiction. It's a huge conflict. And, but we see that conflict always goes on. We can also, of course, compare that to uh, Egypt, the evil empire of the Pharaoh. Can you imagine? I've taught this before in my teaching, what I call evil empire. But the Pharaoh was so evil that the ruler of the entire world wore a snake on his head. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, we've never seen anybody bad, that bad. And this guy was, his, his cabinet members, could turn, could, uh, could turn sticks into snakes. I mean, they were into the occult super bad. That, that's how bad the world was. But in the midst of that, Moses came, and it says, in Goshen, in the, ha in the homes of the people of faith, they were shining with light, so much so that the Egyptians began to come to faith and give them their money, give them their possessions, and, if, and even leave Egypt together with them. So again, I'm just saying the, the, the argument that you can't have darkness and light at the same time is not biblical, and certainly not the anger at us. How dare we believe that there could be revival? But I have learned from this that I made a mistake. I'm always so excited about the revival happening that I forget to mention all these bad things. So I want to just make sure I'm framing it correctly. Yes, there will be a revival, but it's framed in the midst of horrible persecution and darkness and evil and antichrist and all that. So that gives us the right uh, biblical balance. One more example of that, I sort of complete the loop, is we look up in Romans 11, our, one of our banner verses, of course, in which we say that... Um, uh, Romans 11, 25 and 26. And it says, Kehut lev achaza b'midat ma et Yisrael ad asher yikanes mlo agoim v'chach kol Yisrael yivasha. And it says, And uh, hardness of heart has happened to Israel in part until the fullness of the Gentiles' nations come in and so all Israel will be saved. Now this is obviously 
at the very end because he says when this happens, there will be the resurrection of the dead. We'll say, Baruch haba b'shem alayin, Yeshua will come. So the, the full revival in Israel and the fullness of the Gentile Ecclesia happens at the very end. Well, it to say, but you're saying there's going to be a great revival in Israel and the fullness of the Gentile church, that's happening at the end. Well, how can that happen if there's not going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? I mean, that proves it right there. In Romans 11, what, what, how can you be seen? All Israel is going to be saved if there's not an outpouring of the Holy Spirit because all Israel is not going to be saved unless the Gentile church comes to her fullness. So the Holy Spirit is poured out. The church comes to her fullness. Israel gets saved. Yeshua comes back. Hallelujah. But all that happens in the midst of horrible persecution, for sure. That's the way the kingdom of God works. And I believe, actually, it's even a rule of spiritual thermodynamics. To each and every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. To the degree that the light is getting stronger, the, rea the, the, the hatred of the forces of evil is e equal to it. What there won't be is all the space in the middle. You remember Jesus taught this in, in, in Matthew 13. They come and say, why do we have all this good and bad mixed together? He said, because they're intertwined and I can't separate them yet. But he says, when the harvest comes to its fullness, then we'll separate the good from the bad. See, what we have today is, I'm joking with the numbers, but I'm just sort of saying we have like 10% good, 10% bad, and 80% gray and in the middle. But in the end times, it's not going to be that way. There won't be any middle. You're going to choose to be good or bad, and God's going to force the issue on everybody, and then it becomes ripe, and those people that are pushed toward the good, there'll be a huge harvest there. There'll be a harvest of both righteousness and evil. Now, uh, let's go back, if you can, to uh, number four, uh, which jumped out of place for me here. Uh, I want to raise up one more thing and then open up for questions. Um, some of you were telling me that this little list of five things was very helpful to you, so I just want to go over that for you. The question then comes up as to why. Well, if we're going to be, uh, because some people believe none of the believers, all the believers are going to be removed from the world seven years or three and a half years before Yeshua comes back, which doesn't make any sense to me biblically because that's the time of greatest spiritual warfare. It's the time of greatest harvest. It's the time of the, it's, everything happens then, so why would we not be here? It doesn't make any sense to me. But, and also, if, uh, Yeshua said, I do not pray to take you out of tribulation. I pray that you would be guarded in the midst of it. But in any case, um, in going over these verses, like the book of Revelation and Daniel, it sort of jumped out at me, the answer to the question, why? I'm not going to go into depth this, but I just want to list you. I, it's kind of nice to see one, two, three, four, five. You see them all together. Why do we need to go through the tribulation? Why do we have to go through this? And here are five simple uh, biblical reasons uh, for that. And they all lead to victory. They all lead to victory. I just want to say also, you know, it reminds me that in, um, when God took the people of Israel out of Egypt with the multitude that went out with them, he purposely led them into a trap. You know, it's like, thanks a lot, God. You know, it's like, uh, no, don't go that way. That's the easy way. There'll be no, you know, so sure. go this way here. He led them on purpose to a place where they'd be trapped. And what kind of logic is that? Well, he's like, well, he says, look, I'm all powerful. I got to show you something. If it's okay, how can I show you my power? I said, I'm going to put you in a place where it's disaster when you're screaming and yelling right at the last minute. I'll save you. <laughs> so you can know how strong I am. All right. I'm saying that sarcastically, but what I'm saying is God can't show his mighty deliverance if you're not in a place where you need to be delivered. He has to allow us to get into a place where we need to be delivered so he can deliver us. You know, it's, it's kind of a dead because he's got the rest of eternity to have you live in the Garden of Eden forever. He needs one time to show you, you know, that you could be falling off a cliff and he'll grab you, you know, Spider-Man stuff. Okay, so <laughs> let's just... Um, we don't believe in Spider-Man, but we do believe in the Lord of hosts. Amen. So, so listen, here are these five simple reasons. And they're going in different directions. There's a different reason for each one. There's a reason toward the lost. There's a reason toward the believers. There's a reason toward the evil people. There's a reason toward Satan. And there's a reason toward the Messiah. And we say it this way. So the first reason is, is to save those that are lost. We have to be here 
to because there will be people here who are lost and are open to being saved, and we need to get to them and share the gospel with them and, and bring them out of death to likeness, to, to life. That's that ought to be obvious. It was interesting. We were just in, in China and we were speaking to a group uh, from it come to see us from mainland China, and uh, there was a woman there. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, that uh, she said, well, you know, uh, I'm kind of just an ignorant peasant girl, and I don't, I don't know, but she says it just doesn't seem to me that, doesn't it seem that a loving God would want us to be there during that time to share the gospel with the unsaved? And I said, hmm. Yeah, that's how I see it, too. <laughs> it was so brilliant, the way she said it. Ignorant little peasant girl. All right, uh, number two. The other thing is for the believers, we just read it a couple times, that we get purified through the Spirit. It says, with it, the believers get refined. Folks, gold does not get refined in the refrigerator. It doesn't get refined on the sofa. It gets refined by going through the fire. And there's something about it. Now, we can, now, now uh, the substance of our being refined is from meditation on scriptures. Now, don't get me wrong. Suffering doesn't refine you. It's not suffering. It's your faith going through stuff. That's what's the purification. The faith comes from the word of God by grace and us believing and holding in our hearts. But when you hold that faith and it, and it gets attacked and you, and you hold on to it, it just gets stronger and purified. And, and, and so it's, 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 when we come through this, you're going to shine with this. This is going to be awesome. And, and it's, it's going to be such a, a beauty for this. Because it's almost as if God is saying, look, I, I, you need to go through something here. It's going to be a very short period. It's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough. But I need to set this up for the next hundred billion years. I'm going to bless you and glorify you and pour out my grace upon you. And you just got to go sh through something to show that your heart is, is loyal to me during difficult times. Hallelujah. So the second thing is the refining of the purifying of the saints. The third thing is, um, and this is probably perhaps the most difficult one to understand, you have you have to document to evil people that they're about to be judged, that they're about to be punished. The way law works, you cannot bring someone to punishment if there is not a law in place. The law has to be in place and it has to be documented. And you can't just erase somebody. Well, I didn't know this was wrong. I mean, who said you couldn't kill, steal, commit adultery, lie? I mean, that's what everybody does, isn't it? No, no, you have to document to them. And so you go, when going through this, the difficult, and not, not only document the, the crime, you have to document the punish coming, the punishment coming. In other words, part of the tribulation is, is pre-eternity punishment. It's a taste of punishment. You know, it's like if you have a little kid, you're going to smack him on the rear end lightly. You know, so he'll get the idea that if he does something big wrong when he's an adult, that he could go to jail with it. And so he's saying, look, I'm going, I have to show you I have, to, I have to show you that your, your evilness has consequences to it because you're about to face eternal punishment. And I don't want you to face eternal punishment unless I've done everything I can to you to show you, uh, to, to show you that this is coming up. So he's got to bring hardship on that to be able to prepare, pre to, of course, ideally to convince people not to. But if you're not, so let's take the example of, this, of the ten plagues in Egypt. Okay, in, in the New Covenant, there's seven plagues. In the, in the Old Testament, there's ten plagues. But the point was this. If for the people who were open to it, open-hearted, to convince them to get out of that and repent. But for the people that hard-hearted, he said, I need to show you what's going to happen to you. And the, and the punishments got harder and harder and harder and harder. And harder. They kept hardening their hearts. And God said, well, listen, you know, but I'm going to show you what's going to happen. And he pushed them all the way up to the darkness and then the death of the firstborn until they just said, we don't care. We still want to be evil. And then they chased after him. He said, okay, then there's no, more, there's no more plagues. This is just total destruction. But you have to have plagues before you come to co total destruction. Do you understand that? Because the plagues are a warning. It's a, it's a documenting of punishment and evil before the judgment. God is a righteous God, so he doesn't just bring the judgment. And the last reason, oh, no, two more. And, of course, that during this time is we're learning to drive out the devil. We're learning how to fight the battle. We're learning how to bind the devil, cast out. We're getting ready to the point when Yeshua comes back that the devil gets kicked off this planet totally for a 1,000 years and then for eternity. 
Well, God wants us to be involved in that process. He's teaching us. If you look at Moses at the beginning of his mission till the end, at the beginning he wasn't he didn't even sure he could do anything. By the end it was like, get out of the way, you know. <laughs> he went, and so it's a period of learning how to, just, how to push back the forces of evil. We win the battle, but there's going to be a battle. There's a battle in the end times, and we win. And so we're going in this battle to win. So against the Satan, it's, to, tr it's to, to begin to defeat his forces. And the last thing is, of course, toward Yeshua himself is to get us ready to receive him back. Give up everything in this world. Purify our hearts. Be united. Pray. Call him back. Call him to come back. So, it's, so let's go over those five reasons, and I'll close. For the lost, it's to save them. For, uh, for the believers, it's to purify them. For the evil... People, it's to document their coming punishment towards Satan. It's begin to defeat him in spiritual warfare. And toward Yeshua, it's to prepare the way for him to come back. And that's why we have to be there in the last years leading up to his coming. Hallelujah. So let's pray. And let's open up for some questions in just a moment. Father, uh, we thank you that we can understand, yes, there will be hard times. But with the hard times, there will also be the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. It'll be so hard, Lord, that we will be crushed. But out of that, Lord, all these good things of your kingdom will take place, Lord. You're allowing bad things to happen so that good will come out of it. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right, questions, comments.